Great. Take your Bibles this evening and turn. Uh, now, this is one of those messages that every Christian needs to go over. And the name of my message tonight is uh, Five Men That Got Saved. Five Men That Got Saved. And these five men that get saved are after the cross of Calvary and after, uh, after Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and the time of them. And so tonight I want to, we're going to see some things about it. You want to learn something about salvation. Uh, what's the devil interested in, folks? What's the devil interested in? He's interested in damning folks. Amen? Amen. He's interested in damning them. And he's interested in a lot of things, but we know he's interested in that. And so the more we know and the more we learn about salvation, the better we are going to be as Christians. Now, here's a place. You need to write these places down. There's five places. And if you get these places down, you can always show a man something about salvation. Maybe you won't have time to go through all the passages with the person. But if you happen to get a man at the kitchen table and set him down and can show him these five places in salvation, you can lead a man to Jesus Christ and show him everything he needs to know about salvation. Man number one, take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. In the book of Acts, and let's begin in Acts chapter 8. And this, first of all, is known as the Ethiopian Enoch. Enoch. Eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8, and let's begin reading with verse 27. And he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an Enoch, a great authority under uh, Chaldeans, queen of Ethiopia, who had the charge of all her treasure. So this man had the charge of the treasure of uh, the queen of Ethiopia. And so uh, he was coming all the way up from Ethiopia up to Jerusalem. And he had come to Jerusalem, now underline this part, for to worship. Now, first of all, I want you to show you that although this man was a religious man, he was lost. He was lost. You can have religion and be damned. One of the greatest things in Christianity is learn the difference between religion and salvation. Don't ever confuse the two. Don't ever confuse the two as a child of God. Now you say he's very religious. So what? He could be going to hell like a bullet. Have nothing to do with salvation. Has nothing to do with the Christian. I get kind of frustrated when a Christian calls me religious. I do, brother. I get a little frustrated. See, he's very religious. So what? So what? The world full of religious people. Don't ever confuse those two terms. Uh, I was talking, uh, there was a uh, Catholic priest one time we went to this meeting and Sean and I was in this meeting and this Catholic priest, he kept going like this. You know, he kept going like this, you know, taking his fingers together and going like this, you know, going like that. And kept talking real sweet. And I got thinking to myself, and he kept talking about religion and religion and religion and referred to it. And I said, I wrote down a piece of paper, there's a world of difference between religion and salvation. This Ethiopian Enoch was coming up to Jerusalem to worship. He had the right religion. You know what religion he has? He's got the Jewish religion. He's an Ethiopian. He's a convert to Judaism. And he's coming up to Jerusalem. You know, there's only one religion in the Old Testament that had any salvation in it. And that was a Jewish religion. Every other religion had no salvation in it. So here's a man that has the right religion coming up to Jerusalem and worshiping and he's still lost and still damned and still going to hell. Religion won't save you. So if you can point a man to that and show him the difference between religion and salvation, you've made a tremendous step in converting him to Jesus Christ. All right, number two. Let's read a little bit further. Verse uh, 28, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he went up there and he was going back to Ethiopia now, uh, sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. So he's reading the book of Isaiah. Uh, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Underline it in verse 28. 
The Spirit said. Now I'll tell you one thing about the Christian witnessing. You've got to be in fellowship with the Lord. Notice that Philip uh, is going to talk in terms with the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit talk to you? Said the Spirit said. Look at the verse. Said the Spirit said unto Philip. Go join thyself to the chariot. Suppose you was walking down there. And the Holy Spirit says. Go join yourself to you, the chariot. You say, oh, we have all kinds of feelings, you know. You can't, you, you can't trust what goes through your head nowadays. You don't, you don't trust anything. And there's that chariot going there. That would be a waste of time getting that chariot with that guy. I don't even know the guy anyway. See, you better, you've got to get in fellowship. Stay in fellowship with the Lord and know when the Lord's talking to you and speaking to you. He was in speaking terms. All right. And the Spirit said unto Philip, you see, now how does the Spirit talk? Well, uh, you can't always pin it down. Sometimes you have to try the spirits and see what it is. Maybe the devil put a thought in there too, see? It ain't just as easy as saying, well, here it is, that's the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit tongue to you. What if the devil talks to you? You say, well, what do you know the difference? Try the spirit and know how the, what, what is the difference between the Holy Spirit? Any miracle right now can show me, right now, a verse of scripture, how you can tell the difference between the Holy Spirit and an unsaved person. Can any of you give me a verse of scripture right now? Can, can any, if you can, raise your hand. Any of you give me a verse of scripture how to tell the difference? I was found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. That was the verse I was looking for. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4 and 2. That's how you try the spirits to see which one's talking to you. Don't turn there, let's go on. Now look at uh, uh, Acts chapter 8 again. Now let's look at verse 30. This chariot. Notice in verse 29 he says, And join thyself to this chariot. He's definite. He's definite. He's absolute in it. Shows him which one. And Philip ran. Underline that word. Ran. 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 A Christian will never win anybody to Jesus Christ unless he does a little bit of running. You can't be lazy. You can't be lazy. You know why a lot of Christians never win souls? Because they won't run. Amen. Amen. You've got to get up and go. You've got to get up and go. You can't be lazy. He ran. And he ran thither. Boy, I'll tell you something. He was in street fellowship with God and he wasn't afraid to get up and run. He wasn't too lazy to run. Many a Christian is too lazy to run, so he never wins anybody to Jesus Christ. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what I readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him in the place of the scripture which he read. Now look at verse 32. The place of the scripture, the scripture, the scripture. Now, I want to, uh, you write this down. When a man is exposed to the word of God, he'll have ten times a chance of getting saved. Every man that I've ever met that got saved was exposed to the word of God. You've got to, look at here, take your Bible and turn to uh, Romans chapter 10 for a minute. Keep your hand in Acts chapter 8 and turn to Romans chapter 10 and look at verse 17. Romans 10, 17 says, it says, So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. The word of God. Then what you have to do is you have to give out gospel tracts, give out gospel tracts, give out Bibles, give out Bibles, give out Gospels of John, and put out the Word. Expose a man to the Word of God, and he'll get saved. Problem is, nobody's getting exposed to the Word of God. Not can get saved unless they're connected with the Word of God. Uh, you know where I got saved at? I was connected with the Word of God in Sunday school. Chuck, I'll tell you something. All these little kids that you see come up here and you get riding on this bus, and you get all these kids riding this bus and they come in here and pitch your fit and all. I mean, they have all kinds of stuff. I'll tell you something. It may be 10 years down the road, but when we teach them scriptures to memorize, that helps them get saved. That has to do with their salvation. You say, prove it to me. Take your Bible and turn to Second Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 15. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It said, he read... And a place of scripture which he read was thus. You've got to, you've got to open up the book. 
uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and look at verse 15. 2 Timothy 3, 15. Uh, all scripture, I mean verse 15, and, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto what? Salvation. Salvation. So what should we do as children of God? You put out the Bible, put out the Bible, put out the Bible, put out the Bible. You know, the day I was uh, <clears throat> on the street corner witnessing, and I didn't have the New Testament. I had my great big old Bible. This is this is a this is a Bible. This is something else. This is a half. This is this is a, a one. But I had my big old lettered Bible similar to this, and I was opening up like this and giving that guy a verse of scripture, and I said, "Well, look at that. Look at that." And I'd turn over here and I'd say, "Look at that." And then he'd argue a few minutes, and I'd say, "Now that's it, right over here." And then he would argue a few minutes, and I said, "That's easy. That's right over here." And then he had argued a few more months. I said, yeah, and you're right there. And pretty soon he stuck his hand out on my Bible like that and grabbed a hold of it and closed it. <laughs> closed it like that and closed it all up and says, I don't, I don't want to know what that book says. I want to know what you say. Amen. You know what's something? The Bible says, take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and look at verse 12. Amen. The word of God is sharper than what? A two-edged sword. I'm taking out and cutting that guy and cutting him and cutting him and cutting him. What you've got to do if you're going to win some of Jesus Christ, now if you're going to win some, and you, I trust to God you want to win some, you have got to learn and memorize Scripture. You got any Scripture memorized? You have the plan of salvation memorized where you can show somebody where it's at? All Christians, I've said that for years around here. Memorize Scripture. Memorize Scripture. I showed that guy 20 verses of scripture while I was sitting on a street corner there talking to him. You can do the same. You can do the same. That's how you win a man to Jesus Christ. Just go through the scripture with him. Exposing to the word of God. I back to Acts chapter 8 and look at verse uh, 32. And he was, and he's reading in a certain place. He's reading Isaiah 53, 7 is what he's reading. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shears, uh, opened not he his mouth. And in a humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Uh, that's what he was reading from Isaiah 53, 8. 53, verse 7 and 53, verse 8. <clears throat> and Enoch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speak this prophet, this of himself, or of some other man? So the Enoch asked him, says, Who's the, what's the scripture talking about? Explain it to me. Is he talking about himself or somebody else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. Preached unto him Jesus. You know some they're in this chariot, they're going down the road like this, and Philip was up there riding in that chariot going along with him, and you know what it said? He looked over at him and did what? Preached, 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 preached. You know some that's what you do to people. When you win some of Jesus Christ, you know what you're doing? You're preaching at them. You're preaching at them. How many of you ladies have ever had some other woman look at you and say, Well, just quit preaching at me? <laughs> Amen? That's exactly what it is. That's exactly it is. That's exactly what you're doing. You're preaching at them. You say preaching? Yeah. You say a woman? Yeah. I didn't say you was behind the pulpit preaching. Let me show you that. Take your Bible and uh, turn to Acts chapter 8 a minute. And I'll show you where women preached. Acts chapter 8. Now this is the kind of preaching I'm talking about when you're personal witnessing to somebody else. Acts chapter 8. I'm not talking about you being a pastor behind the pulpit. Don't misunderstand me. That's something else. That's for men only. Now here's what I'm talking about. Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And Saul was consented unto his death. At that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And about men... Uh, carried Stephen into his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church and entered into houses and, ha and hailing men and what? Women. Men and women. And committing them to prison. 
Therefore, they, who's the they? The they is the men and women. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. Do you know something? That's a woman preaching the word. That doesn't mean the same thing as a woman getting up behind the pulpit and passing the church. That is for men only. And that's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. A woman is not called to do that. But I'll tell you something, a woman is called to preach. Just like the Ethiopian, just like a woman, uh, she's called and what, what for? Just preach at somebody and preach them, say you're going to hell, you need to be saved, you're going to hell, you need to be saved, you need to get right with God. Many times they'll look at you and say, well just quit preaching at me. Well you're right. That's exactly what you're to do. Alright again, Acts chapter 8. And this, uh, let's read verse uh, 35. Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him what? Jesus. 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 Then you got to tell him about the cross of Calvary. There's the Ethiopian Enoch and Stephen's up in there. You know what they're doing? And tell him about the cross. Tell him about Jesus Christ. He's not telling him about religion. He's not telling them about the church. He's not telling them about his beliefs. What's he telling them? About the Lord Jesus Christ. Pointing them to Jesus Christ. Uh, you want to get a man saved, don't point him to your religion, don't point him to your beliefs. You point him to Jesus Christ's death in the cross of Calvary, his burial in the grave for three days and three nights, and he rose again. He preached unto him Jesus. I and again, also notice verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And Enoch said, See, here is water. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? So in that chariot going down the road, and that Enoch looks over at Philip and says, Yeah, all right, see this river over here? Can I get baptized? Am I qualified? What could keep me? What would hinder me from being baptized? All right. Next verse, verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, there's the proof of salvation. If thou believest with all thy heart. You know what saves a man? Believing in his heart. The Bible says, For with the heart man believeth unto salvation. See, a heart belief. Not a head belief, but a heart belief. Notice in the verse that salvation was while the Ethiopian Enoch was going down the road like that and Philip was preaching to him Jesus and telling him about the death, burial, and resurrection. Philip looks at that Enoch and Enoch says, I believe. When was he saved? When he believed. That's when he got saved. He got saved sitting in the chariot. Going down the road. Just going down the road. They're just driving that chariot down the road and got saved. Got to listen to that. Got believing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, I believe that. When did he get saved? Right then. Right then. If thou believest with all thy heart. Now, for a minute, I want you to take, and I want you to look at that, and I want you to consider something, the great thing about the working of the devil when it comes to salvation. All right, now I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. New International. How many of you ever heard of the New International Bible? Amen, you heard of that. All right, the New International Bible says, And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and Enoch said, Look, here is water. Uh, why shall I be baptized? And he ordered the chariot to stop, and behold, Philip and Enoch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Why, you know something? This says, verse 36 and then it says verse 38, and it's numbered verse 36 and verse 38, and the New International Version, the whole verse 37 is gone. Verse 37 is gone. There's no verse left. The verse is taken out. Why did they take out verse 37? Why did the devil take out verse 37? I'll tell you why the devil took out verse 37, because it has to do with a man's salvation. Now let me show you how many of you have ever heard of baptismal regeneration. You heard of baptismal regeneration? Got to be baptized to be saved? How many churches believe that? Mormons believe it. Jehovah's Witnesses believe it. Church of Christ believe it. 
And a lot of the Pentecostals believe it. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. You know, some, they say, well, you've got to be baptized to be saved. You've got to be baptized to be saved. Look in front of your Bible in Acts chapter 8 right now. Look at verse 37. He's asking the question, am I qualified to be baptized? Is it part of salvation? If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. The verse is the clearest verse in the Bible that baptism is not part of salvation. What did they do? They took it out. Under the inspiration of the devil. Amen. Under the inspiration of the devil, they took it out. What's that? The New International Bible. You say, folks, what should I do? You should show that to somebody that thinks that's a good piece of literature. It's a piece of trash. It's a piece of trash. It's not God's book. Ah, uh, now let me show you another one. Here's the Revised Standard Version. The Revised Standard Version. Uh, Revised Standard Version has no verse, no verse in the margin, no verse anywhere. No verse at all in the Revised Standard Version. You know, some of you ought to take that verse and you ought to just lay out about, uh, I've collected Bibles, I don't have the time to do it tonight, but i got a stack of Bibles that would reach from here to the floor. i got a stack of Bibles reach from here to the floor. And you know the verses I'm getting ready to show you tonight, they've all been messed with by the devil, and they're all about salvation. Now I've checked them. I haven't got time to show you, but one of these days I'm going to show you how they've messed with every single verse that I'm talking about. They've messed with them, why? Because the devil is interested in salvation. He's interested in damning a man. That's what he's interested in. Okay, now here's another one. Take your Bible and turn to uh, turn to uh, Acts chapter 8. And uh, I suppose that's where you are. And this time I'm going to read from, uh, I'm going to read from the uh, New American Standard Bible. Now this is the New American Standard here. I'm reading from it. Uh, what prevents me from being baptized? That's verse 36. And verse 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. Well, the New American Standard has it in. New American Standard has it in there. Well, you'd say, well, that's good for you fellows. Pat you fellows on the back. New American Standard, pretty good. Wait a minute. Marginal reading. Uh, many manuscripts do not contain this verse. Many manuscripts do not contain this verse. I took Nestle's Greek New Testament, read the footnotes at the bottom, and found by the manuscript evidence, AL, which says the greater number also out of other groups have the text in it. A greater number of Greek manuscripts. You know what they just did? They just told a bald-faced lie right there, saying the manuscripts don't have it. They do too have it. The American Standard Version is a lie. They lie. I'm no lie. Call an act. Call an act. You say, how'd you catch him? Take your Bible and turn to Proverbs chapter 30 and look at verse 35. Proverbs chapter 30 uh, and verse 5. Proverbs chapter 30 and let's read verse 5. Show you what it is. Uh, the devil messes with salvation. That's what he's interested in. And so these guys that pervert these new uh, perversions on the market are Bible perverters, and they're run and designed by the devil himself in doing it. Proverbs chapter 30, and look at verse 5. Proverbs 35. Every word of God is pure. Is every word of God is pure? Then don't change the words. You change them, you'll end up being a liar. In fact, if you change them, you are a liar. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you say, how do you know? Read the next verse. All right. He is a shield unto those that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. You know what these new modern Bibles are? They're liars. They're liars. And the men that wrote them are liars in that point. Amen. They're liars in that point. All right, now let me go on. Now take your Bible and let's go to the next verse. Let's go to the next verse. 
uh, then belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, belief in the heart, is salvation. Next man, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 9, and let's pick up the next man that gets saved. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desiring of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Then Paul, I mean Saul, is what? He is a religious man going a rock, stock, and barrel with full zeal, total outward, a religious man. He's so religious, you know what he's doing? He's killing people for his religion. He's killing people. That's what he's doing. He's persecuting a bunch of Christians in the name of religion, thinking he's doing God's service. That's the Apostle Paul. Uh, now, let's see a little bit about his testimony. Take your uh, Bible and turn to uh, turn to this passage. Uh, turn to... Uh, well, let me give you, turn to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. And in Acts chapter 22, the Apostle Paul gives his testimony of when he got saved on the road to Damascus, and he was blind on that road, and three days later he got baptized. And this is the man that baptized him. In Acts chapter 22, let's pick up verse 11. And one Ananias, he's the man that baptized Paul after he got saved. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which were dwelt there, came unto me, this is Paul giving a testimony now about his salvation, and stood and said unto me, now underline these two words, Brother Saul, you know why Ananias called him Brother Saul? Because Saul got saved on the road to Damascus when God struck him down with the light. Not when he got baptized three days later. He got saved on the road to Damascus when God struck him down. Now you know something I learned about this? Uh, let's go back to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, let's pick up verse 3. Acts chapter 9 verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You know what I learned? I learned that not everybody gets saved just like. I mean, the Philippian, I mean, the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was in a chariot. Riding down. Did God take a light out of heaven and kick the Ethiopian out of the chariot and throw him on the ground and knock him down with a light and save him? Didn't do that at all. I mean, he just kept right on down the road, driving down the road. The Ethiopian got saved right there as he drove his chariot. See, now everybody gets saved just alike. So just because you don't get saved like somebody else gets saved, like so-and-so gets saved, don't think you're not saved because you didn't get saved like they got saved. People get saved in different ways. Uh, uh, son, don't you compare your salvation experience with my salvation experience. They're two different things. Don't you compare yours with somebody else and say, well, this, 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 and compare them all down there and say, well, no, I'm not saved if I didn't do exactly like all of them. No, no. They differ. Some things are alike, but they still differ. The place is different. Uh, how you felt may be different. You know, some folks can get up and cry and ball down that, come down that aisle just to ball like a baby and get saved. I like to see those kind, amen? Yeah. But not everybody gets saved like that. See? You can get saved and walk down front and not even shed a tear and accept Jesus Christ. You can save, just be as saved as the next fellow is. See? I don't think you got to get saved just like everybody else. All right, again, verse uh, 5. And he said, uh, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Do you know something? Now look at that thing right there. You know what, uh, you know what these new modern Bibles has done? Now here is the, uh, new international version. Here's the salvation of the greatest Christian that ever lived, salvation of the Apostle Paul. 
Now I'm reading it. Uh, verse 5. Who art you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you persecutest, he replied. Verse 6. He left something out. They left something out. All right, what did they leave out? They left out the working of the Holy Spirit on the man's heart and mind and soul. You know what's connected with salvation? The Holy Spirit convicted you. Write this down. In every salvation, there must be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. In every salvation, there must be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now you say, show us the conviction of the Holy Spirit. All right, read it in your Bible. Read it in verse uh, 5 where it says, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, look at verse uh, 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. And when they heard this, they were what? Pricked in their what? Hearts. You know what they did? They got in a conviction. The conviction of the Holy Spirit started to convict them. In every man's salvation, there is the element of the Holy Spirit convicting them that they're lost and going to hell and need to be saved. That's the Holy Spirit. It is hard. You say, when did it happen to the Apostle Paul? Well, take your Bible and turn back there to uh, Acts chapter uh, Acts chapter 7 and look at verse uh, 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was what? Saul. Well, here's Saul out there seeing the stoning of Stephen and watching Stephen die. And as he dies, Stephen does this. Stephen uh, says in Acts chapter 7 and in verse 59, and they stoned Stephen calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Boy, isn't that something? Oh, Stephen takes and puts down that knee like that and gets down on his knee. And, and while the stones were flying and the stones were hitting him here and hitting him there, he looks up to heaven and says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Well, they killed him, man. Killed him. And he says, forgive them. Why? That's all over there. Religious man looks and says, Man, what a way to die. What a way to die. Man, what Christianity he got. Boy, I couldn't do that. You know something? When Saul sees that, the Holy Spirit starts to prick him. It's like taking a knife and shutting it like that and sticking, sticking, sticking. Starts getting his conscience. It's like taking a little sharp stick and jabbing it like that. Jabbing it, jabbing it, jabbing it, jabbing it. He said, is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks, Paul? You know what Paul was doing? Paul was going against that thing. He said, boy, 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 that thing bothered me. Stephen bothered me. Stephen bothered me inside of him. I have to do a salvation in your soul. Now, you know what the new modern Bibles have done? They took out the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. It's gone. The new international Bible. Gone. Out. Out. You say, what is it? They're messing with the greatest thing on earth. Salvation. Nothing greater than salvation. Nothing, man. Nothing. Tell me something greater than salvation. Nothing's greater than salvation as far as I'm personally concerned. Me, myself, and that, I wouldn't get nothing for salvation if I had to lose it. Why, wow, brother? Nothing greater than that. And they mess with it. Mess with it. Here's the, uh, here's the living Bible. Who is speaking, sir? Paul asked. And his voice required, I am Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. Then verse 6 and on and on. The living Bible left it out too. You know why? You know why they left it out? That word, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You know what happened? God put it in his book in 1611. And then that word comes along like that, and then the devil, you know what the devil does? He comes along and he destroys and takes the word and perverts the word. 
and twists the word and gives the word a different meaning. You follow me? How many of you are with me? You all with me? I'm so when the scholars get up here like this and the scholars come along and with this education of Greek and Hebrew, come along and say, Oh, that word there, we just got to change that word. You're telling the cook! And I'll go to the judgment and give account what I just said. You know some Don't leave the word alone. Don't mess with the Lord. Leave the word just like it is. Don't you use your brain, your education, or nothing. Just leave the book just like it is. You say, preacher, why do you do that away? Because that book is so important that it has to do with a man's soul and salvation. And when you mess with the book, you're taking salvation from a man's soul. You don't mess with it. They mess with it. The uh, By the way, uh, not only that, the Revised Standard Version did the same thing. Revised Standard. Uh, Acts chapter uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. It's uh, out in the New American Standard Bible. Gone. Gone. Right there's the proof. Look at it. It's gone. New American Standard. It's out. They took it out. Took it out. You say, what are they doing? They are perverting God's book. That's what they're doing. Perverting it. Again, let's read on. Acts chapter, <clears throat> Acts chapter 9 in the passage. Acts chapter 9. Notice in the passage in verse 6. Acts chapter 9 verse 6. And he trembled and astonished and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? Me to do. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You know what the apostle Paul did? He come to a place in his life where he stopped trusting his own goodness and started trusting Christ's goodness. Now write it down. There must come a time where a man stops trusting his own goodness and trusts Jesus Christ's goodness. As long as a man is still trusting his own goodness, he'll never be saved. He'll never be saved. The other night, uh, the other night, uh, brother uh, Bob Comfort and I was up in Whitefish and we was knocked on this guy's door. And this guy I was talking back and forth with this guy. And I said to this guy, Jesus, Jesus is the Savior. And pretty soon he kept saying, Jesus is a good teacher. Jesus is a good teacher. And you remember that guy, Bob? And that guy, uh, something struck me in and I said, uh, I said something more about Jesus. And then he said, well, our religions are two different religions. Your religion's one, mine's another. We've got two different religions. They're not the same. I thought to myself, mine salvation is yours is damnation. Wow, brother, you got to stop trusting yourself. Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 10 and look at verse 10. Now write this alongside the verse. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 10 says, uh, for with thy heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Alright, that is verse 10. Now read verse 1. Brethren, my heart and desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear the record that they have a zeal of God, but they're zealous. Can see, you can be zealous and go to hell. Zealous of God. But not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, underline that, and going about to establish their own righteousness, underline that. So it's your own righteousness, ignorant of God's righteousness. Now underline this, have not submitted. That's the key to salvation. Have not submitted. When a man won't submit to Jesus Christ's righteousness and he holds to his own, he'll be damned every time. You gotta quit trusting your own righteousness. Uh, themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believe us. Believe us. There it is. Now turn to the book of Philippians and turn to Philippians chapter three. And let's read a, a, a minute the testimony of the apostle Paul about his own righteousness that he gives. And his own testimony in relationship to his own goodness. There's no salvation as long as a man is still trusting in his own goodness. You know, that's the problem with America today. Everybody says, well, I got my church and you got your church. Well, what's wrong with baptism? 
Well, I'm doing the best I can. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. I'm a good person. You go to hell. See, you got to stop trusting in your righteousness and trust in His righteousness. All right, now let's turn to the verse. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And look at verse 4. Philippians 3, 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. He was a good man. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless. You couldn't hold, you couldn't get Paul on any verdict of the law. Outwardly, he didn't break a one. Verse eight, seven. But what things were gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtlessly, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but what? Dung, that I might win Christ. You know what the Apostle Paul just did when he said dung? He classified his righteousness with God's righteousness. And you know what he called his righteousness? He said, I've been blameless in the law. You couldn't point anything outwardly to me. But you know some. You know what I think about that good life of mine? Living and doing all the good things the law told me to do. He said, it's dumb. You know what that is? That's manure. That's manure. That's what Paul thought of his goodness when it came to getting him to heaven. It'll never do it. There's no salvation when as long as a man is still trusting in his own righteousness. All right, again, take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 10. Let's see the third man. The third man, salvation. The third man, salvation. Born again. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion. Then he's a Roman soldier. He's a Roman soldier. Uh, can't you imagine a Roman soldier with a room with the ear guard coming down like this and the big old frock that come across his hat like that and the kind of skirt and the Roman outfit he had? He's a Roman soldier. A uh, centurion, all right, of the band called the Italian band. That was the name, that was the particular band of them Romans, the soldiers. And his name is Cornelius. All right, a devout man, underline that, then he's devout. But before we go any further, I want you to see and know without a shadow of a doubt, right just in the margin of your Bible, that Cornelius is lost and going to hell. He's a religious man, but he's lost and going to hell. Now let me show you. In the margin, in big letters, write down Acts chapter 11, which is the testimony being given in Acts chapter 11, verse 14, is the testimony now of, of what took place in chapter 10. Acts eleven fourteen. Now, Now let's read it. Verse 14. Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house, now underline it, shall be saved. Underline it. Because Cornelius was lost. Before that time come. He was lost and going to hell like a bullet. He needed to be told. The plan of salvation. And to get saved. So he's lost. Acts chapter 10 verse 1. A Number 1. He's a devout man. But he's lost. He's lost. Okay. And one that feareth God. He fears God. But he's lost. He's lost. And with all his house. Which gave much alms. He gives much alms. He's lost. He's lost to the people and prayed to God always. But he's lost. See that thing? He prayed to God. Suppose you get somebody that prays all the time. They're a praying person. They go to the Methodist church up here. They go to the Episcopalian church up here. They go to the Catholic church up here. And they pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. You say they're saved. No, they're not saved. They're going to hell like a bullet. Praying don't save anybody. 
You say, but they believe in God. So let the devil believe in God. That ain't salvation. You see, but they pray. Don't mean a thing. They're still going to hell. Why? Because they've never been saved. you got to see that thing. All right, religion don't save you. Here's a Catholic. He got all these beads and he gets this bead and he said, Hail Mary, full of all grace. Hail Mary, full of all grace. Goes to the next bead. Hail Mary, full of all grace. Goes to the next bead. Hail Mary, full of all grace. Goes to the next bead. Goes all the way around him and took him took two or three hours to do it. You say, boy, if anybody's going to heaven, that's your good works. You see, salvation don't get you to heaven by good works. I mean, good works don't get you to he- heaven. Salvation in the blood of Christ gets you to heaven. Amen? Amen. And you got to see that thing. This verse of scripture in Acts chapter 10 is the greatest verse to show a Roman Catholic. Greatest verse in all the Bible to get a Catholic saved is Acts chapter 10 verse 1. Show him he's a very religious man and still lost. If he's a good Catholic, this is the place to take him to get him saved. All right. In a vision. He sees visions. <laughs> oh, brother, sees a vision. I saw an angel at the foot of my bed. And I just know it was Jesus. That don't mean nothing. You can still be going to hell. Cornelius saw a vision. Saw a vision was lost and going to hell. Don't mean nothing. You say, man, with experiences like that, I just know I'm saved. All right, what saved you? Did the blood of Jesus Christ save you? Are you trusting in His death to get you to heaven? What are you trusting in to get you to heaven? See, that's what you got to give them with. It's saying of all these experiences, that don't mean nothing. You can do, you can have any kind of experience in the world and still be going to hell without Jesus Christ. You got to have Jesus Christ. All right, uh, verse. Uh, uh, three. Now, he prayed, he sees visions, he fears God, he gives much alms, and he's a devout man, but he's lost. Okay, now let's skip down to verse 43 in the passage. Skip all the way down to verse 43, and verse 43 is the salvation of Cornelius and his household. He gets born again in the passage. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 43, And to him give all the prophets witness, Peter's preaching, that through his name, the name of Jesus, whosoever, anybody, now underline this, believeth on him, shall receive remission of sins. You know something? Cornelius says, I believe on him. Right there. In Cornelius' heart, Cornelius says, I believe. That Jesus died for me, was buried in a grave for three days, and three nights in a row from the grave. In his heart he does that. You know some he was saved just like that. Just like that he was saved. By believing. Alright. Believed on him shall receive remission of sins. That's what Peter's preaching. While Peter yet spoke these words, he's right in the middle of speaking them. The Holy Ghost fell on all those which underline this heard the word. There it is again. You've got to be exposed to the Word of God. Got to be exposed to that book. That's the Bible. They're born again by the book. Peter, while Peter's preaching right in the middle of his message, what is he preaching? Those that heard what, folks? The Word. The Word. Here's Cornelius' salvation. What do you think these new modern Bibles do with salvation again? Let's see what they do. Don't you know the devil's going to mess with salvation? The devil's interested in damning people. He's interested in damning them. Let's, let's see. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Let's get Cornelius getting salvation in verse 43. And let's see what it says. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Write down the verse. The New International Version. Now listen to it. Verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard thee. Message. Message? The message? You know some They think it's a message that saves a man. The message doesn't save anybody. It ain't the message. It ain't the message. It's the book! You know what to do? Devil just slick boy. Devil comes in there, just takes and twists that thing that far and damns a man with it. The message has nothing to do with it. The message ain't nothing. It's God's book that does the work. It's the word of God. They change it to the message. Hate the message. Never the message. No, not the message. You know, people, people are funny. Double slick, boy. 
You say deceiving. This country's being deceived by the millions right now because the Christians don't think it makes any difference if the book has changed or not. And the preachers are changing the book. The preachers are changing it. All of America. But they're, doing, they're damning people. They're damning them. The living Bible. The living Bible. All these, all those listening. All those listening. No, sir, it said all those that heard the word. See, not all those listening. The Revised Standard Version. All who heard the word. Well, that's got it. Revised Standard Version got it in there. How come the rest of them missed it? Revised Standard got it in that verse. Well, you know what it is? You say they're going by the Greek. They ain't going by the Greek. They're just doing what they want to do. They're doing just what they want to do. When they want to lie to you, they lie to you. And when they don't want to lie to you, they don't lie to you. It's that simple. Uh, let's see what this one here is. <clears throat> let's see what the uh, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius getting saved. In Acts chapter 10, verse uh, 44, uh, the New American Standard, it says, uh, all, uh, let's see, uh, all those who were listening to the message, there it is, New American Standard. All those that were listening to the message, never, not the message, the words of God, the book, the Bible. That's what saved you. By faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what, folks? The Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. You don't get saved outside of the Word of God. You know what saved folks? Giving them a gospel track. See, why do you get excited about it? Nobody will get saved that doesn't first you get exposed to the Word of God. You give them the Bible, they'll get saved. You know what the Gideons are? I'm all for the Gideons. You know what they did? They messed up a few years ago and took the King James Bible and went to another version and God wrote Ichabod across them. But everywhere they take a King James Bible and put it out, God's going to bless them. I wish I had all the Bibles that the Gideon had, King James Bible, and could put them out like they used to put them out. They used to really put them out over this country. And I'm for them if they went that away. You know what that is? That's salvation. That's salvation. Only, God only going to know how many men picked up a Gideon Bible at a, at a hospital somewhere and got saved. Or picked up a Gideon Bible at a motel out here somewhere and got saved. Or picked up a Gideon Bible in the Navy or the Air Force or the Army and got saved. You say the message, the message, never the message. You say, why do you get excited? Because that's what's damn in America, that's why. That's what's damning America. You want to know what's damning America? This kind of stuff right here is what's damning America. And a Christian sitting back and say, well, that don't make any difference. See, devil's snake ball, we're right to jump them off area. We're right there where the Lord's getting ready to take us home to heaven. Now, people, you better believe that book and believe it with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and never change your word in it. Because it has to do with salvation. It has to do with salvation. D d don't you know the devil's behind that thing? I've already showed you three places that the devil messed with salvation. Men getting saved and the devil messed with them. In your Bible. Why, brother, that ought to open up your eyes. But some folks it don't. Some folks it don't. Again, take your Bible and this time I want you to turn to uh, Acts chapter 16. We'll finish up one more man. I haven't got time to give you the... Well, I'll, I'll go real quick. But Acts chapter 16, here's the Philippian jailer. Now let's pick up verse uh, 12. Acts chapter 16. And let's look at verse 12. So you'll know of the man. Uh, verse 12 says, And there was at Philippi. So he's known as the Philippian jailer. Philippi. Verse 12. All right, now let's skip up and let's look at verse uh, uh, 25 in the passage. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and every man's bounds were loosed. 
That's quite an earthquake to shake off the chains that are on your hands, ain't it? That's a quite an earthquake that will bust the chains on your leg. There ain't an earthquake in this world to shake the chains off of your hands. There ain't a one in the world. You've never seen one or heard of one. That thing is the Holy Spirit. That thing's God. God's in her end in her. All right, verse 27. And the keeper of the prison awoke out of his sleep. And seeing the prison door open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, the jailer did, and sprang in, he came in, and came, underline it, trembling, trembling, trembling. You know why that flipping jailer is afraid and comes in there trembling like that? That's the Holy Spirit, that's God. Getting him under conviction. In salvation, there's always the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does it. He's there every time. Now, some people react different in conviction. Some people bawl, cry, and do thousands of things. But it's still there in salvation. All right. Uh, verse uh, 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Underline the I. It's personal. In salvation, there must be I will receive Jesus Christ as my spiritual Savior. Who did Jesus die for? Did he die for the sins of all the world? Did he die for everybody? Did he die for you? See, it's got to be personal. I've talked to hundreds of men and they say, well, I believe Jesus died for everybody. No, no. Jesus died for me. 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 My sins. That's where salvation is. Personal. All right, now, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I mean, you can't get any plainer than that. That's right to the point. Verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. There's salvation. You know what man is? Man gets saved by what? Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody can get saved. From a child to an old man. You can get saved, what? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Simple plan. Amen? Let's see what they did with this new modern piece of trash when it comes. Boy, when the devil slick and he wanted to mess with salvation, let's see what he did. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 16, in verse uh, 31, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and now shall be saved. That's God's book. Now listen to it. Believe in the Lord Jesus. What they do? They changed one word from on to in and damned a man. Damned him! With one word! From on to in. Every man in America believes in Jesus. They just don't believe on him. And you're not saved till you believe on Jesus Christ. You say, what do you mean? You're not saved until you start putting your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm putting my faith in this pulpit to hold me up. You see, I'm counting in that to hold me up. I'm counting in Jesus Christ to get me to heaven. I'm believing on Him. I believe in the pulpit. I believe in the pulpit. I believe in that pulpit. You're damned. You're going to hell. You can't believe in Him. you got to believe on Him. You see that? They mess with it. You say, what's that? That's a devil. Messing with God's book to damn a man's soul. What's that? The New International Bible. New International. Right there it is. New International. You say, different doesn't make that difference? When you get to judgment, you'll find out it made a matter of heaven and hell. That's what the difference it made. You say, I can't give it to you. Then don't. You know, a man convinced against his will it is the same opinion still. I convinced you. If the world still says no, brother, you'll go to the judgment and give account of it. See, it's not in the head. It's in the heart. That's where the problem is. Here's the living Bible. Believe on the Lord Jesus. 
They got it. They got it. Got it right. Here's the Amplified. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. The, the Amplified. That ain't the Amplified. That's a revised standard. Here's the Amplified. Acts 16. Here, the Amplified's over here. The revised standard said believe in. Here's the uh, Amplified. Acts 16. Now look at this Amplified Bible. Acts 16, verse, uh, verse 31. And they answered... And they answered, believe in and on the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Look at that thing. In and on. You know why? Right in the middle of that thing, they said, believe in him. Hey, we better make sure. We better get this thing. We'll put as much as we can. We'll throw on and on him. So that has got them both in there. They're crooked. They're crooked. Crooks, believe in him and believe on him. You say, you say, folks, what are you saying? I'm saying the most important thing to you and me is to win a man to Jesus Christ and go by the book and do the best we can and serve God. But as far as our salvation personally concerned, it's the greatest thing in the world. Would you want to go through this life without it? I wouldn't want to go through this life without salvation. It ain't worth it. This life ain't worth it. Amen. Tell me something. Is this life, honestly, is this life worth going through and getting in the end and being without Jesus Christ? It ain't worth it. If you had everything this world could give you, it wouldn't be worth it. Wouldn't be worth it. One more. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 23. And I'm going to quit with this man here. Luke chapter 23. In Luke chapter 23, and again, this man is saved by faith uh, through grace plus nothing. He can't work. He can't get baptized. He can't join the church. He can't sing of the choir. He can't endure to the end. He can't do nothing but just simply believe. That's all he can do. Say, just like you and I. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 and pick up verse 41. And we indeed justly, that's a sinner, repenting sinner talking to the uh, other thief on the cross. And we indeed justly, said we deserve what we got. Underline it. We indeed justly. You know what something about salvation is when a man sees his true condition and admits to it. No salvation unless a man sees his true condition and admits to it. Admits to it. We indeed justly, for we receive a due rewards of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That thief, how he was hanging on that cross in his last minute. This is a deathbed repentance, man. Deathbed repentance. Boy, he's dying, going out into eternity. Hanging on the cross, and he turns his head to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You see, he believed, he got saved and went to heaven. Right there. What did he do? Believed. Believed in Jesus Christ. You say, How do you know? He said, Lord. Now let's see what the devil has done with this one. Now, folks, what I'm showing you tonight is some real wisdom and ought to sink into your heart and mind and soul and ought to last you for the next 25 and 30 years that what the devil has designs in these new modern Bibles is to damn people's soul is what it's about and he deceived thousands of people by it. Hundreds of Christians, hundreds of saved, born-again Christians have been deceived by what I'm talking about right now. Luke chapter 23. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and let's read verse 3. Luke chapter uh, 23. Luke chapter 23 and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'll read the verse. And it says, and I'll read it real quick. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, Wherefore I give, unto, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. 
and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Underline that. No man. Now let's see. The New International Version says, the thief on the cross as he turns his head to Jesus, then he said, Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. They took salvation out of their heart and teeth. They dragged him on a cross and put him in hell. What they do? Took the Lord out of his mouth. Took the Lord out of his mouth. Damned him. Damned him. You say, what is that? That's wise, man. That's why, boy, that's a devil. Mess with five verses of scripture on salvation and the devil messed with all five of them. You know what the stupid Christians do? Oh, well, preacher, it don't make any difference. It's not that big an issue. It's not that important. It's not a big issue. Don't get excited about that anyway. Okay, let them go to hell. Don't get excited about them then. See where you end up at the judgment. You see, Christians wouldn't believe that. They say it all the time. Amen and amen and amen. Some of you might be saying it tonight, for all I know. But I'll tell you one thing. When I get to the judgment of God, I'll say, God, I told you. I have my responsibility. And I didn't tell them no matter how much it cost. It says, cost you money. It might cost me plenty of money before it's all over. But I'll go to the judgment of God knowing I did what God wanted me to do. That's the New International Version. New International. New International. Up here at the bookstore. Good stuff. Making money. They're money making folks is all they are. Making money. Making money. Making money. Making money. Making money. That's all it is. Making a living. Making a living. The Living Bible. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Damn him again. The Revised Standard Version. And he said, Jesus, remember me. Damn him again. Let's see what the uh, uh, New American Standard does. The thief on the cross. The thief on the cross. In Luke chapter uh, 23. In Luke chapter 23. In verse... Uh, what verse is it? 41. 42. Luke chapter 23, verse 42. I see, and he said unto him, truly I said, no, that's it. And he said, and he was saying, Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. New American Standard takes salvation out of the man's mouth. New American Standard. The new, the new international version, we all read that. The Amplified. Then he said, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The Amplified has it in. The Amplified Bible's got it in there. You see, what do they do? I'll tell you exactly what they do. They come through there under the inspiration of the devil and comes through there and takes this and this and this and this and this and this and does with it just like the devil wants them to do it. You know who's behind these modern Bibles? Satan himself is behind them. I'm totally convinced of it. You know how come I'm convinced of it? You Christians have convinced me. Maybe not you personally, but I'm talking about the Christians as a whole. The Christians as a whole. Up here in Collisbell. You see, all these people are saved? Yeah, they're all saved. And they've convinced me the devil's behind it. You know why? Because they're bragging about it and promoting it and uplifting it. And the devil's damning people with it. Now, Christian, you say, what is it? That book is what saved people. The more you know about that subject, you can put it out and put it out and put it out. Put the book out. Every chance you get an opportunity, put God's book out. Put it out. Put it out. Put it out. Put it out. And learn more and more about that great subject of salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for this opportunity to preach your word again. And Lord, I pray that every Christian here would be strengthened as they study the salvation of these five men. And Lord, I pray you'd give them somebody this week to point to the cross of Calvary and point to the shed blood 
and point by faith, trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. In Lord, bless him. Bless him in it. Maybe there's a Christian here tonight to preach you. I appreciate the message. I need the message. And I want God to show me more about salvation than I've ever seen before. And that God will show me everything I need to do about it. Maybe there's a Christian like that. Say, preacher, pray for me that I could learn salvation to the place where I could lead a soul to Jesus Christ this week. I've led some before, but this week that I will pray some. Amen. Amen. Is there another? Amen. Amen. Is there another? Say, preacher, pray for me. Amen. Amen. Is there another? Say, preacher, pray for me that I learned a little bit more. Amen. That I can lead some. Amen. Is there another? That you lead somebody. Me. I'm here. I'm here. Pray for me. Pray for me that I'll get one this week. Every one of us. Amen. Every one of us. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray right now this evening that you would help every soul here to uh, learn a little bit more, Father, uh, how they can point somebody to your Son, Jesus Christ, and lead them. You said, uh, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Father, help us to catch a big fish this week, Father. Each one of us, each one of these ladies here tonight, each one of them, Father, just put somebody across their path, Father, that they can talk to and sit down with, somebody that they can relate with and talk with and understand with, Father, that is in the realm therein that they can associate with and lead them to their Son, Jesus, your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to be attentive of a man's soul this week, Father. Please. And Lord, if there's a Christian here tonight that is kind of doubtful about some of your words in your book, Lord, I pray that they would believe every word, even when they don't understand it, Father, help them to believe every word and not change a word in your book. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Take your hymn and turn the page. I will stand at the door of heaven and rejoice all our love. The Bible stands right as well. We tremble and we tremble. We shall tremble and we tremble. I dream not the world foundation, but the Bible stands. You know what God said? God said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my life, word, shall stand right. And we hear, Amen. When this earth is gone, and the heavens have passed away in the great noise. That book, that book, it's still going to be here. Still going to be here. Still going to be around and gone. So Christian, put it out. The more you put it out, the more people are going to get saved. So put it out, Christian. Put it out. For the salvation of souls. Let's sing the next stanza. The Bible stands on the mountain, dark for the words of man. It is through the heaven and the mud, as in the earth is a rain band. The Bible stands and the rails may tremble on the Amen. 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 Amen.